Um, all right. I think um, let us continue now with a, a topic that builds on these findings. So this is, um, when is hub gene selection better than standard meta-analysis? And that's another uh, first author paper from um, Peter Langfelder. So um, a question is, um, we of course like to s look at modules and we look at hub genes in that module, but um, statisticians will really um, be trained in using standard statistical techniques for selecting genes. And, um, and so here we explore the, uh, the ramifications of these choices. So remember, you can choose intramodular hub genes um, based on these KME measures. And so one question um, is already the, the first one. So why do we look at intramodular hub genes? Why don't we just look at hub genes in the entire network? You know? And um, I will show you shortly that you really want to focus on intramodular hubs, for example, when looking for um, age-related CPGs. Another question is, when you, get, um, when you apply a gene selection strategy um, based on um, connectivity, does it, is, uh, does it lead to um, biological insights that are um, superior to those of a marginal standard analysis? And so here um, I would say yes, I'll show you the data for it. But then, so that would then say, if you want to learn biology, do look at intramodular hubs in um, relevant modules. It seems like a trivial statement, but uh, it isn't. The, there's a third question you can ask. If I look at um, hubs in disease-related modules, does it increase my validation success? What do I mean by that? Well, um, imagine you want to ha develop a biomarker for a disease, predict some disease outcome. And um, so then you could ask, well, should I look at hub genes in a disease-related module, or should I just look at um, genes that are differentially expressed between cases and controls? And um, now the, um, f when it comes to a biomarker, the critical thing is that the uh, associations are preserved in future data sets. Why? Because you want to make future prognostic decisions. And and if, you, if that's your goal, then um, we say, um, overall, you should focus on the standard approach, you know, just the plain old t student t-test or full change, you know. And um, let me flesh that out to you in a second, you know. All right. So um, more formally, the criteria for judging different um, gene selection methods were as follows. The first criterion evaluated the biological insights gained. And that's relevant in basic research. You want to know which pathways give rise to the disease. The second criterion for evaluating gene selection strategies um, was um, that of evaluating the validation success in independent data. So um, w we evaluated here three different applications um, and real data sets. The first one was to find genes that are predictive of lung cancer survival. And um, so here we used as gold standard cell proliferation related genes. Why? Because people know that if your cancer proliferates and grows, then your prognosis is worse off. People know that these are, this is a reasonable gold standard. Um, the other application is uh, the one I described earlier. So find age-related DNA methylation markers. And as I mentioned to you, here we can use um, polycomb group target genes as a gold standard. And the third application involved a mouse data set. So here we used mouse liver tissue data. And we wanted to find genes that relate to total cholesterol levels. And as gold standard, we used um, immune system related genes because there were a couple of papers that showed that genes that correlate with co total cholesterol um, 
are enriched with these immune system related genes. All right, um, what did we use as R code? Um, for the standard screening analysis, we used the meta analysis function in the WGCNA package. Remember, it gives you a host of statistics for meta analysis. And to find hubs in consensus modules, we used the consensus KME function. And here are the results. The left panel of each figure shows um, the um, mean enrichments for different standard marginal approaches that focus on one gene at a time. The middle panel shows um, genes uh, or the enrichment for genes that were selected according to their whole network status, right? These are hubs in the entire network. And the right panel shows um, genes, um, the results for genes selected based on intramodular connectivity. And so what do we see? The first panel, A, shows um, the lung cancer application where we uh, um, judge the enrichment with respect to cell cycle genes. And what do we learn? Well, clearly focusing on consensus modules gives you uh, genes that are part in the proliferation module. And so clearly, you if you knew nothing about lung cancer, <laughs> that would be by far the best approach to use. Um, and I think I discussed in a previous lecture that lung cancer data vary greatly. And so here, a module-based approach made all the difference for learning the biology. The standard methods really would have failed. And um, all right, let's come to the second application. So here, we um, this is the aging study, and um, where we um, rank um, where we evaluate the screening strategies w with respect to polycom group target genes. And again, we find by looking at consensus module membership, we greatly enrich the signal. Having said this, even the marginal approaches f lead to very significant enrichment, right? And therefore, it is uh, no surprise that previous authors using st uh, the standard meta-analyses had found polycom group target genes. You know. um, now, the one thing you want to focus on here is look at the whole network hubs in the middle. Do you remember how I kept telling you look, whole network hubs are often utterly uninteresting? And here are the data. Whenever you select genes as, by, um, as whole network hubs, you learn very little. If any, it's the wrong strategy. All right, the third application was, of course, that to mouse liver expression data. And again, we found um, a module-based analysis really r revealed the relevance of immune system processes. It uh, led to far better um, biological insights. And um, in certain ways, these results justify why you took this course on uh, network methods. If you want to learn biology, these methods are very valuable. But now let's say you wanted to develop biomarkers, OK? <laughs> and um, now validation success matters. And so um, what can we do here? Well, remember, we have these multiple lung cancer data sets. And you can select genes that relate to cancer survival in, let's say, seven of the data sets. And you ask, um, are the, do these selected genes continue to relate to lung cancer survival in the eighth data set? So you judge validation success. And so it turns out that a module-based analysis uh, and consensus KME actually leads to slightly better validation success in the lung data. However, look at the aging uh, study, you know. Ex so if you want to find age-related CPGs as biomarkers of aging, for example, notice these standard approaches, Stufa's method and so on, really outperform consensus KME, you know. 
And similarly, um, when it comes to finding HDL-related biomarkers in liver, I'm not sure why you would want to do it, but <laughs> right? if you want to measure HDL level, why not measure blood? Why take a biopsy from the liver, right? But let's say you want to do it. <laughs> then uh, using the Stufa method, uh, just a standard approach would be better. You know? Yes? So this, you're just using the hub itself as the marker, or the Yeah, so um, everything is always based on um, selecting, a, I want to say, 100 or so, um, or 50, I forgot the exact threshold. You just look at the KME. Yes, the, the, so the network method uses um, consensus KME, basically average KME across the data sets, you know. And um, contrast these figures. If you want to learn that aging relates to hypermethylation of polycomb group target genes, that's a biologically very interesting finding. Um, um, so yes, then you take the module-based analysis. However, if you wanted to find a blood-based biomarker of chronologic age, um, then you are probably better off just using a standard meta-analysis, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Standard meta-analysis kind of selects largest effects? Yeah, well, I mean, when you think about it, it's very understandable why th these results uh, occur. So remember, when we want to find an age-related CPG, it's very intuitive to directly relate these variables. Why would you ignore a CPG that has a very high correlation with age? It sounds crazy to do so, you know. <laughs> um, but why would you want to focus on uh, modules, sorry, to learn biology? Because Sometimes modules correspond to pathways, as lung cancer is an example, right? There's cell cycle pathway. And so focusing on modules um, in that context is clearly a, a, reasonable, a rational strategy because you know there's a pathway involved, why not focus on it, you know? Um, yeah, so that's why I always um, say um, the critical piece in WGCNA is to find um, a disease relevant module, you know, and then look at enrichment. And it often um, leads to biologic insights that could, would be missed. I could give a two hour talk where I could show you case study after case study where WGCNA f discovered a biologic story that is missed by standard approaches, you know. Most recently, um, for example, Dan Gashwin's paper in um, Nature on Autism, um, you know. And, but anyway, so if you want to learn biology, network methods are great. But biomarker discovery, I just don't feel comfortable making that claim based on these data, you know. Yes? Yes? Yes, the, uh, it's, it's not quite a probability. I think it's a mean correlation, if I, yeah, yeah. Um, is, is it for all the top slits, or is it for all the slits and have been uh, for all the top genes, all the genes that have been enriched? Well, uh, okay, so each method is allowed to select the same number of genes. Okay. L let it be... I, I forgot what the cutoff is. Um, let it be the top 50 genes. And then for each gene, you ask what is the mean correlation in the test data. And, you know. And again, this doesn't depend on thresholds in any shape or form, you know. I mean, the one thing that is clear from all of these studies never ever look at whole network hubs, you know. Notice its disastrous performance, you know. Yes? Yeah, well, so let's say you start with a co-expression network based on 40,000 transcripts. Then you can calculate connectivity in that network based on 40,000 genes. So which genes are highly connected to 40,000 other genes? Treating it like one module. Yes, okay. take the entire network as a module. And you can find hubs in that network. And if you do so, you really do something that doesn't lead you anywhere. <laughs> 
And remember, in this whole course, it was you heard the word modules about 500 times a day, right? <laughs> and so why? Because the, you always need to focus on a, d a relevant module, and then all of the machinery makes sense. OK. Um, all right. I would say we now take um, a little break. Um, how about um, 10 minutes? And then we start a new topic, which is supervised learning prediction methods. It's not about networks anymore. Yeah. Thank you.